uh, using the cardiac pad. So we talked about the definition, but how do we test for the viability? Now, testing for the viability, there are several modalities we can, we can use uh, to identify viable myocardium. Um, I'm just going to highlight one of the common ones because otherwise each modality in itself becomes a separate presentation. Um, so the common modalities that can be used are uh, echocardiography, uh, especially the WM in stress echo, uh, SPECT imaging uh, using thallium uh, mainly. You can use the technetium-based uh, radio tracer as well. Uh, cardiac PET imaging using the FDG and cardiac MRI. There is a, a literature coming out um, for cardiac CT, utilization of cardiac CT to identify the, the viability process. But again, I think it's in the early stages at this point. So let's talk about the echocardiographic viability. Uh, but before we jump into that, I think the concept of contractile reserve is, is everyone should understand. It's an augmentation of contractility of a severely hypokinetic or akinetic segment. That's the basis of uh, echocardiographic assessment of viability. Um, it, assessment of contractile reserve in hibernating myocardium in response to low-dose uh, inotropic agent. Now, the protocol uh, the, usually starts with a low-dose stimulation. Um, the images acquire at a low-dose debit, I mean, usually 2.5 or 5 micrograms, and, and, and then subsequently reaches to the peak level. Uh, images are acquired both at rest and low-dose and uh, peak debit, I mean, dose, uh, and, and, and images are compared. And as you can see, this is this is... This chart gives you an idea about how the interpretation works. And the thing of importance is, is right here, where uh, if the, the, the contractility is abnormal at rest, uh, resting segmental wall motion, uh, but that contractility improves at rest, uh, at low dose uh, with dobutamine. Uh, however, when the dose reaches the peak dose, the, the contractility worsens, uh, mainly because of the, the, um, the coronary uh, restriction of blood flow. So this biphasic <coughs> response is, is the diagnostic criteria for the hibernating myocardium using the dobutamine stress echocardiography. Now, as seen in this image, um, the yellow arrow uh, indicates it, it's, it shows the mid-inferior wall segment at rest. Um, at low dose, as you can see, the thickness improves. Uh, these are still images, uh, so can't assess the contractility. However, uh, the, the contractility improves with low dose dobutamine. At high dose, uh, there is some decrease in contractility. When the dose reaches the peak, the, the contractility actually reverts back to the, the baseline level. So that shows this biphasic response and indicates that the mid-segment is in hibernation. Compared to that, if you look at the basal segment, which does not change throughout this process, suggesting infructed myocardium. So some of the advantages of, of the BMI stress echocardiography, it's readily available, uh, no radiation exposure. It is more specific than SPECT, which we'll talk about in a minute. There are other useful information like wall thickness, LV diastolic diameter, uh, LV ejection fraction we can, we can get from the echo. The disadvantages it has to do mainly with the image quality, which is dependent on the patient's, uh, patient's body habitus, lung disease, et cetera. Sonographer's experience is also very vital to this, this technology. Um, it is lower in sensitivity and it's complicated in patients who has tachyarrhythmia or uncontrolled hypertension. The other modality is aspect uh, viability. The, the viability characteristics uh, depends on the regional perfusion and cell membrane integrity. The most commonly used radio tracer uh, for SPECT viability is thallium. You can use technetium. Um, thallium is a potassium analog which requires uh, um, active sodium potassium ATPS dependent channels across the cell membrane um, for the uptake. So if there is an uptake into, into the myocardial cell uh, that establishes the functioning um, ATPS channels, in turn establish the viability. Uh, redistribution properties of thallium is very important for assessing myocardial viability. 
Now, this is the, 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 the picture of, of Telium viability scan. Um, this row represents the resting uh, Telium imaging, and in the bottom row represents the delayed Telium imaging. The delayed imaging can be performed at four hours or 24 hours, and as you can see, that compared to the resting imaging, uh, there is a clearly significant redistribution of thallium in, in delayed imaging, uh, indicating a viable myocardium. The advantage of SPEC viability is SPEC testing is available very widely. Um, it's part of the, you can use uh, this as part of the routine stress rest protocol as well. Uh, it's more sensitive than the vitamin stress echo. The disadvantage is it's the highest radiation exposure among all the, the technologies that we can use to assess the viability. Uh, it's prone to attenuation artifact, and the biggest thing is it's an all or none interpretation. Uh, basically, you can get an idea about whether the myocardium is viable or not. Uh, extent of hibernation or viability uh, is, is something that you cannot determine, and that results in a lower specificity. The third modality is a cardiac PET. So cardiac PET um, requires a, a combination of, of resting myocardial perfusion imaging uh, using the rubidium or N13 ammonia um, and metabolic imaging with uh, FDG. FDG is a, is a glucose analog. Uh, so there is, if, if a, a study proves the FDG uptake into the myocytes, then it's established that, that there is a glucose metabolism present in the, the myocyte, which can only be happening in a living cell um, because the dead cells don't eat. Um, the protocol is, is, uh, is unique. The patients required to fast for 6 to 12 hours, and, and, and when they come for the test, uh, the glucose levels are measured, uh, and, and then they were load, there is a glucose loading followed by insulin uh, to increase the uptake of glucose in the myocardium. The purpose of fasting is to switch the, um, the, the cell metabolism from, from utilizing fat to glucose, and when the glucose loading happens, it it's increases the glucose uptake into the um, active myocardial cells. So again, the cardiac PET imaging sort of looks like the, the same um, as, a, as, a, as a SPECT imaging. However, the, the differences um, are, are significant. Um, so the top panel shows the resting uh, PET imaging, and in the bottom, in bottom panel shows the FDG PET imaging. Uh, and as, the, as you can see where the arrow is pointed in the mid to apical anterior segment, uh, there is an increased FDG uptake which suggests a viable myocardium. Uh, this topographical uh, map shows the resting uh, image and, and there is a uh, FDG image, and so basically we are looking at a, at a mismatch, uh, the flow and metabolic activity mismatch, and then the bottom topographic image shows the mismatch. The degree of mismatch is identified in the PET imaging, which is very important to identify the extent of viability, which we'll uh, cover um, later as well. Uh, but this is one of the advantages of the, the, the PET. So, Cardiac PET uh, has a better spatial resolution, attenuation correction, and diagnostic accuracy than SPECT, uh, higher sensitivity and specificity, and ability to differentiate hibernating myocardium to SCAR. The disadvantage is PET is not widely available. Uh, radiation exposure is there, however, it's, it's less than SPECT, and it requires fasting and controlled uh, blood glucose levels, so it can be challenging in patients who have uncontrolled diabetes. Now, let's talk about the cardiac MRI. Um, so cardiac MRI, there are a variety of criteria that can be used to identify uh, hibernating myocardium, um, LV and diastolic wall thickness, uh, inotropic contractile reserve using the vitamin stress cardiac MRI, and the most commonly used uh, transmural extent of scar with late gadolinium enhancement. As you can see here, the, the, in a normal myocardium, the gadolinium is an extracellular matrix, uh, and 
the, when we acquire the images um, late, uh, usually 10 minutes after the initial gadolinium injection, it allows the washout period so the gadolinium would wash out and, and the in normal myocardium would be null. Um, compared to that, in a scar myocardium, the cells are replaced by a collagen matrix and the gadolinium usually gets stuck within this matrix and takes longer time uh, to, to wash out from that segment. So f once we identify that the time, uh, usually 10 minutes after the initial injection of gadolinium, we could see uh, the presence of gadolinium in the myocardium to determine if uh, that segment has a scar. Now this is a, a short axis image of the, the CMR. This is, this is the still frame from the CINE image and this, uh, image shows the late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, the dark uh, segments are uh, the, the vi viable myocardium where the gadolinium has been washed out uh, from this, the, the myocardium into the blood pool. However, uh, as you can see here in the interoceptal and interior wall segments, uh, subendocardial segments, because that's how the ischemic um, insult happens in myocardium, uh, the, there is a hyper intense uh, intensity you can see which corresponds to the scar. Uh, the cardiac MRI gives a, a, a the image quality that um, that none of the other uh, imaging technique can provide and more so you can measure the extent of the, the myocardial uh, scarring. Now looking at this image and understanding this modality um, Actually, the cardiac MRI assessment of viability is, in fact, is an assessment of non-viability. We are, we are assessing the presence and extent of the scar and then implying that the rest of the myocardium is viable. Um, so sort of a misnomer in terms of whether it's a viability testing or actually an assessment of non-viable myocardium. So uh, in a paper in New England by Kim and, and colleagues, they showed that transmural extent of hyperenhancement by cardiac MRI and their re its relationship with the improved contractility. So they divide the, the extent uh, into uh, absence of scarring, 25% uh, or less scarring, uh, 25 to 50 and, and so on. And then they looked at uh, the extent in terms of the improved contractility using different segments, whether it's akinetic, dyskinetic segments or all segments together. And as you can see, the, the, the 50% is sort of comes as a clear cutoff. Uh, more than 50% scarring, the, the improved contractility was significantly less uh, compared to the patients who had less than 50% myocardial scarring. So, so that's the, the most commonly used assessment uh, for cardiac MRI assessment of viability is 50-50 rule, less than 50% uh, scarring in the myocardial segment. Uh, possible viability, less than 25% more likely viable, um, 50 to 75% possible non-viable, uh, and, and more than 75% uh, non-viable myocardium. This image here um, shows the end diastolic frame, and, and, and this is the end systolic frame. So you can see the end diastolic frame, there is a myocardial thinning there. Uh, the bottom panel shows delayed enhancement, and you can see a, a thin line of um, uh, subendocardial scarring. Now, you can visually appreciate that the, the endocardial scarring is about 25% uh, of the full myocardial thickness, um, suggesting myocardial viability. Now, this patient underwent revascularization, and, and now the, the, this panel shows the post-revascularization uh, while thickening in, in diastole and in systolic phase, and it shows clear improvement and regain uh, function. So advantage of cardiac MRI, um, high resolution images, high sensitivity and specificity, uh, no radiation exposure. It's a gold standard for volumes and EF assessment, so that, that's an important information that we can get from this study. Um, ability to evaluate the extent of transmural scar, uh, again, very important, not just the presence of uh, scar, but uh, 
how, how extensive the scarring is. Um, assess the contractual reserve with low dose dibutamine stress. Um, it's a very interesting concept. Uh, like I said, the cardiac MRI assesses the presence of myocardial scarring, and, and, and if there is a no scar, then we assume that this, the myocardium is viable. However, we have not proven any, 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 any potential benefit of revascularizing in terms of the functional improvement. Studies have shown that indirectly. However, you can perform a low-dose dibutamine stress paired with the MRI and show that the, the viable myocardium, whether it has contractile reserve or not. And, and then combining those two, not only proving that it's viable, but viable with contractile reserve has a, has a better, uh, better outcomes in terms of the improving contractility and ejection fraction. Simultaneous evaluation of other etiologies for cardiomyopathy is also possible, uh, mainly the infiltrative cardiomyopathy by CMR. The disadvantage is that CMR is not readily available. Uh, image quality depends on the breath holes and e EKG gating. Uh, usual MRI contraindication includes the presence of ferromagnetic metal in patient's body. Um, contraindication, uh, it, the contrast contraindication in patients with advanced uh, renal disease well known. So these are some of the different topics. There are other, other methods which can be used to assess the cardiac viability. Uh, includes the echocardiographic perfusion imaging, uh, which was a big deal uh, back in early 2000s. Um, strain imaging is coming up. There are different radio tracer is, is being studied uh, for assessing myocardial viability. There is a CT imaging being considered for myocardial viability and especially useful as considering the CT imaging is widely available. So there is a lot of, lot of ways you can assess the viability. However, currently, uh, these are the, the methods that most commonly used. Now, what's the best method? Like, what, what, what do we need to do? Now, simply speaking, uh, the best test is the one that's available to you uh, that you should consider. Um, if you have an option uh, to perform all kind of viabilities, at Erlanger, we do MRI cardiac viability, but we do not do uh, PET viability currently. So our options are limited to uh, dubitamine stress, BECT, or cardiac MRI. Um, so now comparing the imaging modality, is, it's, a, it's a tricky, uh, tricky situation. Uh, Romero and group did this uh, meta-analysis uh, by pulling the data from 100 and 105 studies, about, about 3,000 patients. Now, the biggest caveat to this comparison is that all these studies are done in different decades, different time, different machines, different technology, different readers, so there is no quality control um, done with this study. However, that sort of gives you an overview of, of, of what's going on with each uh, technology. And even though those limitations are there, but this pretty much confirms the, the, what the individual studies have shown in terms of sensitivity and specificity for uh, each uh, technology. So the BM in stress echo um, has more specificity than uh, SPECT imaging. However, the SPECT is more sensitive uh, than the DBM in echo. Now, for all practical purposes, in, in current time, both the BM in echo and the SPECT viability imaging is considered a traditional imaging. And uh, PET FDG and cardiac MRI is considered sort of advanced imaging for uh, myocardial viability. Now, cardiac PET um, obviously has a has a much better sensitivity compared to the other modalities. The specificity is about the same as the uh, as the SPECT imaging. But I think the interesting findings are here in in in, in the cardiac MRI uh, uh, portion. So late gadolinium cardiac MRI very sensitive, 95% uh, sensitivity and negative predictive value of 90%. Uh, and if you look at the dibutamine uh, cardiac myocardial uh, imaging, which basically assess the, the contractile reserve um, in, in the myocardial segment, Specificity is 91% and positive predictive value is 93%. So the idea is that what if we combine the low-dose dibutamine uh, stress and 
the late gadolinium enhancement into one protocol and assess the myocardial viability to improve both sensitivity and specificity of the testing. And there are some studies that have shown that actually it's, it's much, much better. Uh, again, more work, needs, more work needs to be done in, in that area, but again, it's very promising, uh, promising uh, proposition at this point. So we have talked about the, how to define the myocardium, uh, myocardial dysfunction and hibernation and myocardial viability. We talked about the different uh, methods we can use to uh, identify the presence of hibernating myocardium. Uh, how do we use it in, in a clinical setting? So again, these are, these are older data from Allman and, and, and colleagues uh, published in Jack 2002. So they did the, the, the meta-analysis, 24 studies, about 3,000 patients. Uh, each overall, the average ejection fraction was uh, less than 35 percent. So they simply divided the, the, the group into viable myocardium and non-viable myocardium and, and assess uh, the benefit of revascularization versus medical therapy. So as you can see, in patients uh, with a viable myocardium, uh, the mortality rate was significantly higher in medical therapy group compared to revascularization group. So clearly showing benefits of revascularization in, in viable myocardium. Uh, in non-viable myocardium, the difference was not significant. So can we conclude that revascularizing is the best strategy? Uh, probably not. Uh, however, if you ask the surgeon, uh, they could argue that, well, there is no harm uh, compared to medical therapy, so, and there's a benefit in vi viable myocardium, so I guess the best strategy would be revascularize everyone and, and uh, treat them with medicines afterwards. Now, similar findings were also reported by another meta-analysis in 2008 by Kiminisi and group. Um, they did the same thing, 13 studies, about 2,500 patients, ejection fractions less than 30 uh, percent, looking at the mortality rate in viable non-viable -myo non myocardium, similar findings. In viable myocardium, the revascularization had lower mortality rate compared to medical therapy, and in non-viable myocardium, uh, no difference. The problem with this meta-analysis is, is, is the inherent problem with most of the meta-analysis that this, there's no quality control uh, in, in the study. However, to simply imply, so if you want to draw a conclusion based on this data, and I've shown you just two slides, I mean, there are, there are a lot more meta-analysis done showing the, the similar findings of benefit of revascularization in, in, in presence of viable myocardium. Uh, so the simple interpretation could be that ischemic cardiomyopathy, if there's a viability and you only do medical therapy uh, destined for poor outcome versus if you consider revascularization, the outcome could be better. However, we know that it's, it's, not, it's not entirely true. Um, all these studies, uh, meta-analysis, uh, included retrospective cohort studies. Uh, they included all heterogeneous imaging modalities or criteria. So they had echo, they had spec, different radio tracers. They all lumped into one group. Uh, which, is, which is not ideal, and then the criteria for defining viability was different. And the biggest of all is uh, this were done in, in before 2000. So what is considered medical therapy back in the day is, is totally different than what we consider an aggressive medical therapy currently. Uh, so it's entirely possible that the majority of the patients uh, in, in these this studies done in 90s or early, in, in, you know, 80s or 90s, they may not even have received a beta blocker. Uh, so the, using this data to justify viability, I think it's a little premature. Um, and, and, and more so that we know that there are lots of data suggesting the benefit of medical therapy uh, in improving the LV function. So even if you talk about just beta blocker, not talking about the RAS inhibition, uh, again, this paper in Lancet, they used both SPECT and, and uh, ECHO-based uh, viability to show that the patient uh, with viable, viable myocardium using beta blocker alone improves the ejection fraction compared to the patient who did not get beta blocker. Again, the same 
findings in using the cardiac MRI viability improvement in function uh, with, a, with use of beta blocker. Uh, again, the same thing with the SPEC alone uh, viability. So again, there are, this is just a sample of the literature out there that if there's a viable myocardium using a, a high intensity medical therapy alone gives you the benefit uh, in terms of the functional improvement. So in light of all this knowledge, uh, it's easier to dispute the meta-analysis done uh, previously, proving the absolute benefit of um, uh, revascularization in patients with viability. So it's getting confused now uh, whether is it beneficial or is it not? Like, why do we even need to do it? Uh, so maybe the prospective study would help. And then that's what we thought. Uh, and then the, here comes the STITCH trial. So the STITCH viability substudy is actually a substudy of the original STITCH trial, highly anticipated uh, study when, when the results came out uh, in, in New England 2011. So just to talk about a little bit of stitch viability substudy. So it was the original cohort was 1,212 patients with EF less than 35% went for surgery or medical therapy. Uh, out of those patients, 601 patients uh, had the viability study done, and the studies that they used was the Dubirium stress echo or the SPECT imaging. Primary endpoint was all-cause mortality, and secondary endpoint was uh, cardiovascular mortality, death plus CV hospitalization. So uh, as you can see here, uh, from years of randomization, the mortality rate uh, was much lower in patients uh, who had viable myocardium based on the imaging studies. However, uh, these are univariate analysis, but when included in a multivariate analysis using the risk scores, EF, uh, end diastolic volume, and end systolic volume, uh, the difference between viable and non-viable myocardium in terms of mortality risk was not significant. So this was a big bummer. Uh, everybody was expecting that it would it would it would solve the mystery once and for all and 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 settle on a on a specific indication for use of myocardial viability, but that did not happen. Uh, but again, uh, we didn't stop trying. So we divide the group. Uh, the study authors divide this group in patients with. Uh, viable myocardium and non-viable myocardium who either uh, went for surgery or uh, stuck with medical therapy. And as you can see, no difference. Uh, in, in patients with viability, the medical therapy and, and, and patients who underwent uh, uh, bypass grafting, the mortalities were not significant, um, those group. So the substudy results were in patients with CAD and LV dysfunction, assessment of myocardial viability does not identify patients who will have the greatest survival benefit from adding cabbage to aggressive medical therapy. So after STITCH, uh, it created a lot of confusion in, in terms of should we use it or should we not use it. Uh, the people, uh, the, 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 the physician who believe in myocardial viability, uh, they argued the limitations of the study. Uh, and, and, and the physician who did not believe in the concept obviously uh, accepted the findings. So the question was, I guess this is it, right? But no, we, we continue to follow these patients, and um, it, it, it depends on the group published a, another paper 10 years later using the same cohort that they followed, and unfortunately showed the same findings, um, that there was no difference in, in medical therapy versus the coronary uh, artery bypass grafting in, in patients who had either viable myocardium. Or, um, now, there was a difference uh, overall uh, mortality benefit in patients who underwent cabbage plus medical therapy compared to medical therapy alone, but no difference observed in patients who had myoc uh, myocardial viability uh, before um, undergoing revascularization. Now, the only benefit that um, was observed was change in uh, ejection fraction. So as you can see, the patients with viable myocardium 
uh, regardless of the treatment option, whether they received the medical therapy or uh, bypass surgery, uh, there was a, a positive change in uh, ejection fraction was noted compared to a patient with non-viable myocardium. So again, this sort of supports what we have seen in, in randomized uh, studies before that the viable myocardium in presence of either medical therapy or revascularization has a potential to improve the the contractile function and ejection fraction in general. Uh, however, so far, based on these studies, it has not translated into an outcome difference between the medical therapy alone versus the revascularization. So the study findings do not support the concept that myocardial viability is associated with long-term benefit of, of cabbage in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, however, the presence of viral myocardium was associated with improvement in LV systolic function, regardless of the treatment, uh, but this treatment was not related to long-term survival. The, the limitations, so, we cannot talk about stitch without the limitations in the in, in the in the in the study. Uh, first of all, it's not a randomized trial. The original cohort was randomized, but the viability substudy is not a randomized study. The viability was performed at patient's discretion. Uh, there were clear differences in baseline. Uh, patient characteristics between uh, viable uh, group and non-viable group. Uh, the study had a lot of influence in terms of the, the viability testing as well as the management based off the results. Uh, so there was no uniform uh, standardized um, guideline there. And they used the SPECT and the vitamin stress echo, which uses a, a sort of a dichotomous uh, interpretation of viability, whether it's a present or not, uh, rather than dealing with the extent of, of myocardial viability. So the question was that, well, what about the extent of the myocardial viability and whether a more advanced imaging would have far better uh, in situation? So. Here comes the PAR2 trial. It's a Canadian trial. They used the cardiac PET with FDG uh, to, 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 to do the same thing that uh, Stitch subgroup did, uh, improvement in, in LV dysfunction patients with uh, revascularization. So they enrolled 430 patients. Uh, they used the PET FDG as a primary modality. There, this study was randomized between those two groups, and the primary outcome was cardiac death, MI, and cardiac hospitalization. However, again, the same story repeated with PET as well, that there was no statistical difference in, in survival uh, between the PET arm and standard uh, medical therapy arm. The study, uh, one of the limitations in this study was that about 25% of the patient, uh, even after randomized to the PET arm and having the viability, did not follow the, the protocol guided uh, therapy interventions. So what the authors did is that they divided, they removed those 25% patient and, and looked at the patients who adhered to the recommendations based on the PET diagnosis versus the standard of care. And they did see the difference there uh, in having a, a, a lower uh, uh, a lower survival rate in, in a standard arm compared to the patients who had the PET recommended uh, therapy guidance. So something positive finally uh, out of all this, all this, all these studies. However, this was a, a portion of the original study. Um, and again, the argument was that the sample size is smaller. Uh, we are dissecting. This wasn't powered to uh, look at the end point in the specific patient populations and so on and so forth. So even though there was a benefit here, uh, people are using this benefit uh, with a grain of salt. So here, all this study, stage and the part two, we are talking about the, the, the presence or absence of viability, but the, but the question is like, okay, you know, maybe that's not helpful, but how about the extent of viability? Maybe that's going to be helpful, right? Uh, and then there is literature, there are literature that supports that concept that the, the, the more viable myocardium, the better outcomes. And, 
this is one example uh, by Ling um, and shows that, that about 10%, so more than 10% hibernating myocardium, uh, the early revascularization is, is obviously it's a, it's a, has a benefit in these patients, uh, 650 patients with low EF using the PET imaging. There are several other studies using the SPECT, using the dobutamine stress echo, even though those, the stress echo part is, is somewhat confusing because the extent of viability, uh, the, the implied based on the segmental involvement, which is not, which is not correct. Uh, but those studies, especially from the SPECT data, and they show different degree of, of cutoff in terms of at what threshold the viable myocardium would benefit from revascularization. So even though conceptually and, and with limited data, the extent of myocardial viability does support uh, uh, revascularization uh, along with the medical therapy. However, that threshold is yet to be determined. In this paper, 10% viable myocardium, 7% my viable myocardium in other papers uh, have been proposed for cardiac PET, but for MRI and, and SPECT has been different. So both this trial, high expectation, didn't deliver, especially for um, the cardiac imaging world. Um, but again, uh, the, the hope's not all lost. Uh, there, is a, there is a new trial that's undergoing right now, and I think they have finished enrollment already, and so results should be expected pretty soon. And it's an AMEHF trial. Uh, and as you can see, the, the enrollment and the randomization appears to be very robust. Now, we'll, we'll see how it turns out, but they are using both uh, the spec-based uh, viability as well as the CMR and PET-based viability, standard imaging and advanced imaging, and in guiding the therapy decision to uh, optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy uh, plus revascularization. And considering this study is done in, in, in this decade, we hope that the medical therapy would really be uh, what guideline medical therapy is currently. So again, this is very exciting and, and hopefully this trial would uh, settle the issue in terms of uh, what the critical card recommendation is going to be, uh, but we'll see. So after all those data, and again, I have just shown you just this a glimmer of data because it's the first slide I show you, there are, there are tons of publications, tons of literature out there for myocardial viability. It all gets confusing. So should we use the myocardial viability or should we not use the myocardial viability? The data shows that the viable myocardium uh, when supported by uh, optimal medical therapy or revascularization has, uh, has, has improved uh, 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 contractile function uh, in that segment and LVEF in general, and we know that the improvement in EF has translated into the improvement in C, uh, uh, symptoms and quality of life for, for most patients. Now, assessing the, the, the viability-guided therapy and long-term outcome, especially the mortality benefit, is, is still not there. Um, so. If you would like to use the myocardial viability, I think you should first uh, not only rely on the presence of myocardial viability, but also look at the extent of the viable myocardium, which certainly helps identify high-risk patient group. Again, these patients are coronary disease with ischemic cardiomyopathy. So high-risk patient groups and, and, and helps you predict uh, the response to guided, guideline director medical therapy and also response to revascularization. So, so again, there is a benefit to assessing myocardial viability in, in this high-risk patient population, especially if uh, revascularization is consider is, is a high-risk surgery or uh, CTO interventions or, or other high-risk procedures. Now, myocardial viability should not be used uh, as a prerequisite for deciding what patient's going to get, whether interventions or, or uh, medical therapy alone, uh, because again, the, in terms of the outcome, the, the matter has not been settled yet. So that's, that's all for me uh, about myocardial viability. Um, thank you.
I know. It's a, the question and answers are the things that makes it makes it a lot of fun. But yeah, it's a. Yeah. So by definition, the virus is a hibernating myocardium sleep at risk, right? Because there are loads of that myocardium in, in, in cells so or decrease. And, and the point decrease so that myocardium can hibernation is a directly protective mechanism. And, and so if you have enough chunk of myocardium that's in hibernation, then the cumulative, the, the ejection fraction 